Hello, uh, my name is Raquel. Um, so my project was on zoonotic disease risk factors associated with non-human primate human interaction in a captive setting. <clears throat> this is just my poster, which some of you may have seen up there, and then my key points. So, um, zoonotic and reverse zoonotic diseases have detrimental impacts on wildlife that can result in illness or death. It's estimated that about uh, 60 to 75 percent of emerging infectious diseases in humans are zoonotic, and in cases such as captivity and in zoo institutions where human and non-human animals interact, chances of zoonosis transmission is higher. This research focused on lemurs in captivity at the Toronto Zoo using a One Health approach in an attempt to uncover unknown roots of zoonotic disease transmission between humans, hosts, and the focal species. The goals of this fact-finding research were to determine new potential risk factors for zoonotic and reverse zoonotic pathogen transmission, create a systems map showing these potential risk factors, and provide recommendations to the Toronto Zoo on possible mitigation strategies for the newly identified risks. We used scan sampling techniques to observe lemur behavior at the zoo, while also recording contextual environmental observations that assisted the data. I conducted a semi-structured interview and participant observation with the zookeeper to incorporate qualitative data into the final analyses. We found some possible routes of transmission through visitor animals, which include the wild and peri-domestic animals such as rodents and birds that are able to enter the lemur enclosure. These animals can carry pathogens into the enclosures through feces, which can then be transmitted to the lemurs and potentially to their human keepers. We also found possible risks in current food storage and transportation protocols, as there is additional risk of visitor animals accessing storage locations. Current literature also suggests food preparation, such as food washing, uh, food, such as washing produce, can be another route of zoonosis transportation that should be investigated. The next steps for this research is to create a final systems map outlining these observed risks and complete a gap analysis that can be presented to the Toronto Zoo to help illustrate the risks and routes of transmission that were recorded during observation. As this was a purely observational fact-finding project with no hypothesis testing, future research will benefit from creating testable hypotheses based off these observations and may consider testing feed and pests for parasitic infestations, as well as investigating efficiency of chemical pest control and additional pest control systems. Thank you. Hi, right, great presentation. Um, do you mind really briefly elaborating on what you were talking about with the food washing, the products washing? Yeah, absolutely. So um, it's uh, what I found in my uh, literature reviews uh, while doing this research, um, it's found that even uh, produce that's uh, developed for human consumption still contain uh, parasites such as the uh, red, uh, fox tapeworm and other tapeworms that uh, could affect could be affected like, that humans can be infected by and so can animals. Um, so when uh, produce comes in that are being given to the animals at the zoo, in this case lemurs, um, if they're not washed, there's risks of these parasites being transmitted into the enclosures, to the animals, and to the zookeepers, potentially. Hello everyone, my name is Haley Davidson and my project is titled Wastewater-Based Epidemiology for the Characterization of Foodborne Pathogens Using a One Health Approach. So as many of you may know, foodborne illness is a global public health concern with one in eight Canadians suffering from foodborne illness each year. But current surveillance methods rely on passive detection, which is flawed in many ways. Therefore, a new, more efficient surveillance method is required, which brings me to wastewater-based epidemiology. As we have seen with the recent COVID-19 pandemic, wastewater is an invaluable tool used for early disease detection. In my lab, we have developed a cartridge-based filtration method to isolate six bacterial foodborne pathogens of clinical concern in Canada. Using this method, we have been able to we have been able to quantify pathogen levels using real-time PCR, which brings me to my preliminary results. So here we have our first three months of data for three of our six pathogens. And from these results, we can note some key points. Firstly, that wastewater-based epidemiology is a promising real-time surveillance tool used for foodborne pathogens. It is also inherently one health in that it connects human, animal, and environmental health. But overall, continuation of weekly sampling is required to provide representative baselines of each of the pathogens in the, waste, in the wastewater. Using these baselines, we are hoping to be able to detect peaks 
which can be attributed to possible foodborne outbreaks, and therefore, public health officials can be notified in real time before an outbreak progresses. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I was just wondering, in terms of the wastewater based surveillance, is it that these types of bacteria aren't normally found in the wastewater, or is there a way to distinguish if it's associated with a foodborne illness or just from like an environmental um, source, so like that source tracking aspect? Yeah, so the wastewater is sort of the direct collection of human waste. So those uh, six pathogens are pretty much excreted in people's um, waste, which is collected in that wastewater. Um, so we take that direct wastewater effluent um, and we are able to quantify those pathogens. So we're, we'll be able to see them sort of all the time. So my project is going to create that baseline sort of for those levels. And then if we see peaks on those, then we can sort of see if those could be possible foodborne outbreaks because people are excreting that bacteria more often. Hi, um, my name is Grant and I'm a master's student in the Department of Population Medicine working with Dr. Lauren Grant. Uh, my project focuses on social and environmental inequities in foodborne and waterborne diseases in Canada. Um, so in Canada, these diseases place a preventable burden on the healthcare system. <clears throat> and in order to reduce this burden, <coughs> sorry, it is crucial to understand and document subpopulations and geographic regions most affected by these diseases so that prevention mechanisms can be put into place. However, individual socio-environmental information is not commonly collected for food and waterborne diseases. This lack of collection hinders our ability to understand whether certain socio-environmental populations have an unfair or disproportionate burden of disease compared to the general population. I am addressing this gap in knowledge by conducting a scoping review to gather evidence of foodborne and waterborne disease inequities in Canada. My work today is presented on this poster here, uh, where I detail the protocol that will be used. I will then present my findings to a group of stakeholders in health equity and food and water safety uh, using a modified Delphi approach to help, uh, to help engage them in how to mobilize our findings, identify research gaps, and to establish future, future research priorities. So, so far we have uh, developed a detailed scoping review protocol. This protocol includes a list of databases for both academic and grade literature, as you see in the t uh, table up at the top left. Uh, these, oh sorry. <clears throat> And one of the strengths of our scoping review is the number of pathogens and contaminants that are included. Uh, this list is presented in Table 2 on the right-hand side, and it was, it was developed with input from the Public Health Agency of Canada and Health Canada experts. And as an example of how a pathogen will be identified in our scoping review, I have listed the mesh terms and keywords um, in Table 3 on the bottom left for Brucella. So the next steps of our research, which is on the left-hand side, uh, are to use our developed search strategy protocol on our selected databases to retrieve relevant articles for our scoping review. We will then extract and analyze the data from these retrieved articles according to socio-environmental stratifiers. Using these results, we will develop and conduct our workshop for stakeholders using a modified Delphi approach. The, the results of this workshop will help identify key research priorities in future areas of action. Thank you for listening to my presentation. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Hello everybody, so um, I actually have the rest of my our research team here with me as well, presenting. Um, so my name is Christine, I'm a second year health science student at McMaster University. Um, my name is Jacqueline and I represent Western University. My name is Amelia and I'm from McMaster University. My name is Annie and I'm representing uh, University of Guelph today. And my name is Asima, and I'm also from Western University. So we'll do a quick um, introduction. We're all representing the Canadian Courage Project, which is a nonprofit organization based in Canada that supports youth facing homelessness and their animal companions. And through this organization's work with the specific demographic, they noticed there was gaps in resourcing for community based supports. So we conducted a scoping review to look at exactly that. And. So we have two research questions, first one being what community supports currently exist in Canada for the specific population, and the second one being where are the gaps in these community initiatives that currently exist. So we'll go through some of the findings. So in terms of our findings, we conducted a thematic analysis and our top three themes that came up were the lack of support for marginalized youth, negative interactions with the shelter system, and in addition to that, there are sort of a lack for harm reduction focused services which help to prevent homelessness and additionally we found that only eight sources outlined real strategies that have already been implemented across Canada to try and combat youth homelessness 
And finally, we only found two out of 56 of those articles analyzed youth facing homelessness with animal companions, which was our large focus of this scoping review. Um, so when it comes to our first two themes, themes one and two, we found that youth facing homelessness that provide um, sorry, services from shelters, experience stigma when asking for help, as well as deal with mistrust with their service workers and live in unsafe and unsanitary conditions. Now from this, one of our next steps we propose is to implement cultural competency training for all service provider staff. And this would have an emphasis on youth marginalized communities, such as racialized youth, youth in the LGBTQS plus community, as well as youth with disabilities. And to touch on our third theme, we noticed a lock in the harm reduction services for youth experiencing homelessness. Um, and um, this also connects to the eight articles we found that touched on the uh, implementation of programs across Canada um, supporting youth facing homelessness. Um, and so we recommend there is a need for more of these um, supports, um, and specifically supports that are interdisciplinary, uh, sorry, multidisciplinary, um, community based, and focusing on harm reduction services. And lastly, relating back to our research question. Um, which was focusing on youth facing homelessness and their animal companions. Uh, like Amelia mentioned, we only found two of the 56 articles that were focused on this population. Uh, so definitely further research is needed and we need to consider the potential benefits of pet ownership for these youth facing homelessness. Um, often companionship is one of the biggest things that they provide and uh, like we often found that Pets may limit the access to shelters and social services for these youth. So kind of considering both the benefits and the drawbacks and developing programs uh, specifically tailored to this vulnerable population. Thank you so much. Your group represents three different universities, which is amazing and fits so nicely into today's theme of collaboration. I was just curious how your team came together. Um, yeah, so we all volunteer for the Canadian Courage Project, uh, like we mentioned, and so this is kind of an extracurricular activity outside of academics. Thank you so much for your presentation, that's awesome. And so just kind of in relation to the gaps that you highlighted here, I'm curious if you found anything in the literature about how these gaps affect the health of the, or the well-being of the animals owned by the youth. Um, there was quite a bit of lack of research on the animal aspect of pet ownership, but we found through our work with the Canadian Courage Project the negative impact that surrendering an animal does have on the animal. Because um, oftentimes if youth are refused housing and refuse these services, they do need to go the route of surrendering their animal, which negatively impacts them being in the shelter space um, and being moved homes, things like that, um, as well as the lack of resourcing for animal care um, in the homeless population. So whether that be grooming, uh, regular veterinary checks, things like that. Okay, thank you. My name is Manuel Perez Maldonado. I am a PhD student in the Population Medicine Department at the University of Guelph. Um, the title of my investigation is The Role of, Anti of the Environment in Antimicrobial Resistance Dissemination in Canada, a Scoping Review. Here are, are the poster. Here is the poster. I wanted to show you with this that uh, for some introduction, there is a lack of data about the occurrence and spread of antimicrobial resistance dissemination in biosols in Canada and in the world. So, Having that in mind, the objective of this project is to describe the occurrence of antimicrobial resistance in the environment and to identify the sources and pathways of antimicrobial res resistance dissemination in the biosols, in the water and in the soil. Uh, for that, we did this scoping review. We include the terms biosols, water and soil, antimicrobial resistance and Canada and different provinces of Canada. And we found uh, here we have the results. We found uh, in biosols very uh, few studies, only eight. And in water and soil, there are more. But we can find this research gap about antimicrobial resistance in biosols. And the key points would be um, that, well, we have this gap in the antimicrobial resistance in biosols. And in here, we um, try to interpret 
um, the different sources and pathways of antimicrobial resistance in specifically to bio, bio aerosols. And we have a big component of animal farms and waste with the plants and different other sources. And the importance of this data, of the literature review, um, is that we are going to, uh, to try to interpret, interpret this through an integrated assessment model. So the sources of the data for this integrated assessment model would be the literature review. And uh, some people are now collecting some samples along Canada about um, antimicrobial resistance um, genes in viruses. So with this data, we are going to populate the um, integrated assessment model that I try to represent in here below. Um, that, and some issue is that this integrated assessment model is kind of linear. So we have to um, try to find a way to um, include the different uh, sources and pathways uh, to this model. So here I represent um, three different animal systems and we can see that within and between these uh, animal farms we have this um, antimicrobial resistance dissemination through the environment. Um, and that's all. Thank you. <laughs> it seems to be important. I would never have thought of pine needles as a bioaerosol. Yeah, it's, um, that specific part is some um, component of the project uh, because this, uh, this literature review is just a part of the project. Uh, um, so some people is collecting this data along Canada and specifically the pine needles is in the north of Canada. They actually they did one of the studies and they, for example, studied the pine needles surrounding uh, swing farms in the north of Canada. And they found that the more far of the swing farms these pine needles were, the less antimicrobial resistant genes they have. So they concluded that we can use that the pine needles like a sort of sentinel. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Michael Woods. I'm a PhD student in the JGM lab uh, in the Department of Molecular and Cellular Biology at the University of Guelph. And I'm gonna briefly talk to you about um, antifungal resistance and how we're trying to overcome it in C. neoformans. Um, so Cryptococcus neoformans is an opportunistic like uh, fungal pathogen, uh, usually infects people who are immunocompromised, uh, such as people uh, with HIV uh, AIDS. Um, so crypto likes to live in soil um, and it becomes uh, integrated with uh, fungicides that are applied to um, crops. Um, so these fungicides are azole antifungals. Uh, one of the main drugs used uh, in treatment of uh, Cryptococcus neoformans is uh, fluconazole, which is an azole drug. We see this cross resistance between this where people are being infected with um, Cryptococcus that are already um, resistant to treatment, um, which is the problem, which is what we're looking at. Um, in the JGM lab, we are developing a pipeline uh, to try to discover protein targets to uh, overcome uh, antifungal, re antifungal resistance. Um, so I just wanted to outline uh, that pipeline right now, um, which first is that we develop a resistant strain in the lab to fluconazole. We then do a proteomic analysis of this resistant strain to our wild type strain to identify proteins that are significantly different um, in the resistant strain. We then choose from uh, these uh, proteins to target either through gene deletion or uh, we try to find an inhibitor if it's available. Then we target this and then apply fluconazole to see if it's once again susceptible. From there, we try to go to a host model to see if there's any therapeutic uh, potential of this. So we have a lead compound um, that we've gone through, or lead protein, uh, CLIPX. So what we found so far is that once we target CLIPX, it significantly reduces fungal growth. Um, with our first assays here, and then we moved to a, uh, a host infection. Uh, first, we looked at macrophage, and we see similar results. We see completely um, redu not completely, sorry, uh, reduced growth um, after targeting CLIPX, as well as once we move to a mouse model, uh, we look at the brain and the lung um, to see how much fungal growth grows there. And after targeting CLIPX, we see uh, significantly reduced growth. 
Uh, and also something we saw that once we targeted ClipX, uh, mice tend to survive longer in the presence of fluconazole. Um, and our next step is trying to use a inhibitor and try to optimize it to see if, once again, we can elaborate on a therapeutic potential. Thank you. Hi, very nice work. So do you have any idea how you foresee a therapeutic application of these findings? Right. Um, it's very early stages because, well, once trying to find like um, targets of fungal uh, pathogens, it's very hard because they're very similar in nature to uh, human cells. Um, so if this were to progress, we'd have to do a lot of optimization and finding out how well inhibitors bind to specifically uh, fungal clipex. Okay, hi everyone. Thank you so much for staying here and for being so attentive. Um, so we're going to switch a little uh, gears a little bit and I'm, I'm going to talk about One Health Pedagogy and that's what my master's thesis focuses on. So the title of my thesis or this chapter is Pedago Pedagogical Approaches That Best Prepare Graduate Students to Address Climate Change and Other Urgent Health Threats. To kind of just prime the page, we can all agree that climate change is a One Health factor. There, it, influences the different pillars and we need to collaborate with people from different pillars in order to properly address it. So my research is trying to focus on how to best prepare graduate students in their courses. As Dr. Frisbee mentioned earlier today, I took a few courses in my undergrad too. I sat through them, I did the test, but did I retain any information out of that course? Can I recall anything that I learned? Or will I be able to apply that? And that's what we wanted to figure out. Mostly, we wanted to see what, what pedagogical approaches would really help students retain the information and the skills that they learn in their course. So we have these identified One Health competencies, and we wanted to address the pedagogical uh, strategies that would best help students keep those competencies. And we did that by conducting focus groups. So we conducted focus groups at Guelph, and we allowed students who had taken One Health courses or are enrolled in the One Health program to participate in the focus groups. We actually had two focus groups full of DVM students, one focus group for the collaborative specialization students at, Western, at Guelph, and then we actually went to Western and we asked the students in One Health courses and their programs to be a part of our focus group too. So um, I won't focus on too much of that, but let's zoom in on the results here. So the research is still preliminary. We are doing the analysis of the focus groups, but I, I put together four main findings that I can present to you today. So the first finding was that there needs to be a fine balance when you're using technology. So for instance, let's talk about Zoom. There's the chat feature on Zoom. A few of the focus group participants said that the chat feature was very helpful. In situations where their professor was talking, if a student had a question about a spe specific discipline, another student from that discipline could chime in. So you have the collaboration aspect, you have that communication aspect, you have that problem solving aspect. But at the same time, they actually found technology to hinder their learning when instructors ins assign them to use a new like, software. For example, Jamboard. Some students had no idea what Jamboard was and they spent so much of their group activity time learning the interface that they really didn't get to, to the work. The next thing that we found out was that case-based learning helps them understand how their knowledge can be applied to real situations. So giving them a case and presenting them with a real life scenario actually allows them to see how their knowledge can be used in other situations too. The third, third key finding that we found was that panel cell is valuable for building professional and ethical competencies. When we introduce, um, when the instructor introduced a panel of experts or just a panel of people that use One Health in their work, the students actually found it very personable. They were able to ask the panel a lot of questions, kind of figure out the path that they took to get to their position right now. So it was, it was a little bit more informal where the students felt comfortable, but they also gained that valuable information about what they can do with One Health in their careers. And finally, a, a great piece of feedback that we got from students was that they actually really wanted a greater focus with local stakeholders. Sure, real life scenarios are great, but if you're talking about something happening in Bali, it's really hard to put that into perspective when we could be going into the community and finding a One Health problem within the community. So from the focus groups, these were our 
four main findings, and we're trying to put, to put that together to create a framework and to help suggest pedagogical strategies that would best help instructors ensure that their students are really understanding and taking in and are able to apply what they're learning in the One Health program and their courses to solve these urgent health threats like climate change. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm wondering, are you going to be presenting these findings to faculty, departments, and will you actively be engaging students, One Health students, to have some type of power in choosing how they want their education to be received? Yeah, so we are doing a piece with, so this is one part of a larger project. So the other part of the project, a PhD student is actually collaborating with faculty and people in various One Health positions. So we're trying to take that, all of that knowledge and create a framework with that. Um, there are some, when we are talking about teaching and instructors, we can't force someone to adopt a certain pedagogical strategy. The best that we can do is recommend, very highly recommended and hope that they adopt it. So there is that kind of like fine line of not, you can't force something on someone, right? So, but through this focus group, that was our point of the focus group to try to get that knowledge in place, right? And going forward, even beyond this, um, beyond this project, we do have plans of kind of introducing an evaluation framework that can be used to make sure that the program is going, running smoothly and if, and then students are welcome to provide their feedback there too.